I sure did. Earlier this year, I thought it'd be a great idea to try to play every single version of Team Sonic Racing, the Sonic spin-off kart racer from 2019. It was not a great idea. Some people would probably look at me and say, what could possibly be different about the ports of a spin-off racing game? Well, that's where you're wrong. There's a surprising amount of differences in each version of Team Sonic Racing. From something as simple as frame rate to my favorite South American country right now, Team Sonic Racing might be one of the most interesting port differences out of the recent Sonic games release. So, today, I'm going over all of the differences between nearly every single version of Team Sonic Racing, while also going over my thoughts on the game as we go. Before we really start diving into every single version of this game, let me quickly go over my thoughts on Team Sonic Racing as a whole. So, what do I think? Team Sonic Racing is a boring kart racer that I heavily dislike for multiple reasons. When it was first being teased, yeah, they teased the kart racing game. It was hyped up as if it was the next big Sonic game. Full on CGI trailers, a main theme by Crush 40, the Sonic R symbol was in the freaking logo, like, this was set to be the best Sonic racing game of all time. The last two racing games had entirely Sega casts, not just Sonic. They were still considered pretty good, seeing all the Sega characters together in one game, as well as having the second one specifically standing out against the rest of the games by having its own gimmick of transforming from a car to a boat to a plane. But one thing many people were clamoring for was a spin-off of these games featuring mainly characters from the Sonic the Hedgehog series. Having it just be Sonic this time would be the perfect opportunity to not just have the mainstays that we all know, but maybe even a few obscure characters. Maybe the hooligans could come back after another chance from Sonic Mania. Maybe Marine the Raccoon could come back, the Babylon Rogues, or maybe we could get some IDW characters like Tangle the Lemur. Please, 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 please. At the very least, we can rest assured knowing that Sally Acorn will never be added. So, what was the final roster? Four fifths of this roster was in the last release, Sonic Forces. So, immediate problem here. This is an incredibly boring roster. Of course, you have the characters that have to be here. All of the Genesis characters and Shadow, then you have Silver, a few extra characters, and... Well, we'll slap him in somewhere. These are just some of the most basic character picks that you could have ever pulled out. And only 15 of them? Am I happy Big the Cat is here? Yeah, of course. But do I want it to stop at him? No! Where's Tails' parents from Archie? Obviously, I don't want them to go too crazy with the picks, pulling out Sonic's robot dad or something, but at least spice your roster up a little bit. This is smaller than Mario Kart 8's roster. On Wii U. Without the DLC. When you first start the game. I'm sorry that I'm getting really upset over a stupid Sonic racing game, but this is just not that great of a roster. On top of that, some of these teams just make zero sense. Of course, you have Team Sonic, Team Dark, and Team Rose with a group of Chow and sub the Rabbit for some reason. Okay. Team Vector? With Silver and Blaze? You couldn't get his own team? They were in the last game! Team Eggman Empire with Eggman, Metal Sonic, and Zavok, the guy who wants Eggman's head on a stick. Cool. Dude, Sega was trying to make Zavok a thing so bad. They put him in this game, Sonic Forces, the IDW comics, the Archie comics, Mario and Sonic at the real 2016 Olympic Games. Really? Like, if you want to put him in Team Sonic Racing, sure, go ahead. But put him in a team that makes sense. Don't put him in a team with the guy he wants on his wall and perceive that he's loyal to him. Screw off. I don't understand how you can have a series known for Sonic's abundance of annoying friends and yet you don't use them. But a roster isn't everything. It's all about the racing. What do I think of the racing? It's fine. Well, before we even start driving our car, this is probably one of, if not the best looking Sonic game of all time. I don't know what Sumo Digital put in this game to make it look this visually stunning, but it was probably something very, very illegal. Every stage is wonderfully lit and has incredibly high quality textures. The only Sonic game that I'd say remotely compares to this game visually is something like Sonic Unleashed, and honestly, I think that this game has a slight edge. I don't know what exactly it is, but something about it just looks superior to Unleashed. Maybe the lighting's better, maybe it's the fact that the game's, for the most part, on newer gen hardware. I don't know. The controls and physics of the game are ripped straight from the second Sega racing game, Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed. 
but without the transforming parts of it. It's all really fun to control, and dare I say, more fun than Mario Kart, but it feels really empty without the transforming elements that helped Sonic's previous racers stand out so much, where you'd be racing on a regular track before something happens and your car transforms. In Team Sonic Racing, however, the whole gimmick isn't something grand like changing the entire track. Instead, it's a reference to a good game. Sonic Heroes! Some call it a good game, I call it a good game. It had you controlling three characters in a team. A speed type character, a flight type character, and a power type character. They'd each have their own roles to play and be able to reach certain routes that other characters can't. In Team Sonic Racing, this is adapted into a racing game, except it doesn't work unless you're playing with multiple people. And as we'll see later, that isn't possible for some people. The game depends on you working with your teammates to all rank high in the rankings, as well as working together by flowing in a teammate stream or trading items with someone in order to fill up the team ultimate gauge. That gives you a big boost of speed. However, an easy way to do this is to trick the AI into thinking you constantly need items by pressing the circle button over and over and over and over and over again until the gauge is filled. It really ruins the game for if you're trying to play the game on your own. With three or more people, it can be alright, but it just doesn't change the fact that I can't have a good time on my own. This on top of more than half of the tracks being reused from the previous racing games, it really doesn't change how you play the game or anything. Well, what if you are on your own and you want a better experience? Well, for one, you could go play Transformed. The Solo Matches! These are basically the team races, but even more bland and boring than before. If you want to play a Sonic racing game without the transforming by yourself, I may have found the perfect game. Along with the Solo Matches is also an adventure mode. A few of the Sonic racing games that released before the Sega racing games, such as Sonic Riders, had a form of adventure mode where you'd have a set of predetermined races with cutscenes left in, and they were pretty fun little distractions back then, but what does Team Sonic Racing have that they don't? Why is Sonic so ugly? Yeah, this isn't fun. It's literally just the team races in single player with the paper cutout cutscenes rather than fully animated ones, and characters that we can go against but can't play as. Which sounds pretty cool, but I'm kind of bummed that I can't play as a Death Egg robot after beating him. Don't know why he's here though. Despite all of that though, there is one thing that I do believe Team Sonic Racing does that's pretty alright. The Garage. In the Garage, you have complete reign over the design of your character of choice's vehicle. I'm talking the color of each part, the design of each part, the tires, the horn, the decals, it's got everything. It's so cool to see all this customization in a mascot racing game, and I think it's really the only big one to have customization on this scale. It also came back in Sonic Colors Ultimate, but it actually didn't because that game doesn't exist in my vocabulary after this very second. And of course, what is a modern day racing game without online? Let's wrap this up so I can talk about the differences already. So, concluding this part, Team Sonic Racing has some kinda cool parts like the customization, visuals, and such, but it's still a generic racing game that doesn't do much to stand out, and for someone like me who's been playing the other Sega racing games, it hurts more to have half of the stages in this game reuse and lack of transforming. If you haven't played those other games and don't care that it doesn't really have anything fully unique and just want to have a fun time with the mainstay Sonic characters, it's perfectly fine. And hey, the game is mostly sold in a bundle with Sonic Mania, one of the best Sonic games ever made for like $30, and that's an absolutely fantastic deal. Anyway, with all that out of the way, let's talk about the differences between each version of the game. Stop me if you've heard this before. The PS4 and Xbox One versions are nearly identical. Nobody's stopping me, what's happening? The Xbox One VCR has a few issues running the game at a full 60 frames per second, but everything else is fine. And I believe the PS4 runs fine on everything. I'm trying out this version of the game through the PS5's backwards compatibility, since I've never owned a PS4 in my life. Essentially, this is the PS4 Pro version of the game running on an SSD that can barely change the load times. Cool. Each console version runs at different resolutions, with the base PS4 and Xbox One VCR versions running somewhere between 900p and 1080p, and the PS4 Pro PS5 backwards compatible and Xbox One versions run somewhere between 4K. Mom, pay attention. All versions run at a rock solid 60 frames per second, with a few Xbox One VCR themed exceptions. Unfortunately, I don't have the tools to show my footage at 60 frames per second, but believe me, there are people who have shown the accurate frame rate online before, and that's 60, all right. But yeah, those are really the main points about the main console versions to bring up. Now here comes the fun part. The other versions. The PC version's main differences are that the DRM de Nuvo supposedly prevents piracy of the game. Sonic Mania's DRM was cracked a week after launch. It also heavily hinders performance, so even if your PC is more powerful than a government supercomputer, you still might get frame rate drops because of the DRM. On a more positive note though, the PC version also allows you to change the visual settings depending on the power of your PC. That's it. Moving on. 
The Nintendo Switch version is probably the most played version of the game and the most well known for its changes. Since the Switch is essentially a portable Xbox 360, a lot of games suffer when being downgraded to the system and TSR is no exception. For starters, the minute you boot up the game, you'll immediately notice that the intro cinematic is completely removed. This is apparently because Sega chose a cartridge that couldn't hold the video file without upgrading to a bigger card and thus increasing the game's price. I don't understand why they couldn't just make it a day one patch to add it through an update so they didn't have to increase the cartridge size, but I guess they didn't want to. While the menus still run at 60 frames per second, entering a race reveals the proper frame rate to be 30. This really does change up the game, since you need to accommodate for the choppier gameplay and fewer input opportunities. The game also runs at a lower resolution, going down from the Xbox One X and PS4 Pro's near 4K to 720, both docked and portably. This isn't the biggest deal in the world, because aside from the resolution, the game is visually almost identical to the Xbox One and PS4 versions of the game, unless you were like really paying attention, you could mistake this version for a version of the game on more powerful hardware, and that's insane to say. Like, here's two video captures of the game. Which one's Switch and which one's Xbox One? They're both PS5. Many Sonic games released before and after this game saw heavy downgrades being ported to the Nintendo Switch, but Team Sonic Racing is out here swinging with these visuals. Honestly, it may be one of, if not the best looking game on the handheld, period. I'm very surprised by this game's visual performance. It's not just in races either, the menus are also different. For one, when I unlock a golden vehicle part, instead of playing the small chime that I barely notice, it plays an incredibly loud jingle that makes my ears bleed. Who tested this? There's a new mode for local wireless play, and the font on the menus is different. Let me repeat, the game's font is different. Why? Also, inviting friends in online games isn't possible because the Switch didn't have an invite setting back when the game launched and nothing of value is lost. Overall, the Switch port is a perfectly serviceable version of the game. If you had any other option like the PS4 or something, I'd say avoid this version and go for the PS4, but if you only have the Switch and really want to play TSR for some reason, then this isn't a bad way to play the game. But that begs the question, what is a bad way to play? On the moon, apparently. That's right, Team Sonic Racing made an appearance on Amazon Luna. You know what they say, you either die the hero or die soon enough to see yourself be ported to Amazon Luna. Now, you're probably thinking, Amazon Luna? What's that? Well, aside from being the title of my astronomy project, it's Amazon's game service where you pay a monthly fee to have access to tons of well-known titles, such as Assassin's Creed Origins, Assassin's Creed Unity, Assassin's Creed Chronicles, Assassin's Creed Liberation HD, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, and Sonic Colors Ultimate. The thing that makes Amazon Luna different from things such as Xbox Game Pass or PlayStation Plus Extra is that every game is fully streamed from their servers like a movie on Netflix. A video image is being streamed to you as you play the game, not requiring any sort of processing power from a console or download to your computer, you just grab a device you have, select the game, and it just starts. On paper, this sounds like a great idea for more accessible games, however you also need to factor in that your Wi-Fi speeds need to be up to snuff to run games like this in order for the inputs on your controller to be sent to the server and back to you in a matter that doesn't make it feel like I'm playing Super Smash Bros. Brawl Online in 2008. So I've tried TSR on two different internet connections, let's see how it fared. So, as we connect to our game, we immediately notice that there are no Sega or Sumo Digital splash screens. I assume it's because Sumo Digital was bought out by Tencent, but it could literally be anything, honestly. The intro cinematic is also removed for some reason. This is running through the internet, there's no limit in how much space you need on the servers. Why was this removed? Well, either way, going into the main menu... <laughs> the online mode has been fully removed. Now, this makes sense. The other consoles barely have any online communities. I didn't even get a full lobby on the PlayStation and I got nothing on the Switch. So if Amazon Luna is gonna change the player count from a few thousand to nobody, why add it in? You can still technically play online through the Luna Couch mode where you send a friend a code and you both stream the same video to each other as if you're on the same couch, allowing you to play split screen multiplayer. Yay. Everything else about this version is pretty much identical to the main console versions aside from adding the necessary keyboard controls. But how is the streaming quality? Honestly, it worked pretty alright. I've had a few experiences where it lagged on me, but most of the time, it worked fairly well and I sometimes forgot that I'm streaming the game because of how seamless it can all be. But of course, as I say that while playing Sonic Colors Ultimate, Amazon kicks me off of their servers. If this is your only way to play Team Sonic Racing, how? Then this is somehow an alright way to play the game if your internet speeds are up to snuff. 
The only things you'll really be missing are the online and the intro cutscene, the former of which doesn't even matter at all, and the latter can be viewed on another app inside the same device that you play the game on. With all of that said, we have one more version of Team Sonic Racing to tackle, and this one isn't even Team Sonic Racing. Sonic Racing on Apple Arcade. Now, you're probably wondering, what's that? Well, Apple Arcade is the Apple subscription service where you pay a monthly fee for mobile games ad-free. If it sounds stupid, it's because it is. But Sega didn't want to miss out on that Apple cash, so what did they do? They took their mediocre racing game and cheese grated the crap out of it to be simple enough for iPhones. Sonic Racing is essentially a simplified version of Team Sonic Racing. There are fewer racers on the tracks, the tracks are smaller, the controls are simplified, and the game is less visually stunning. I don't understand why it's called Sonic Racing though, because there's still a team mechanic. It, that doesn't make sense. Although, bonus points for having original levels. The game is also a bit more accessible, having multiple control schemes, including a simple tap in a direction, a steering wheel, or a simple thumbstick. The game also has the option to be played in portrait mode. Why would you do this? There isn't really much to go over with Sonic Racing, it's really just a simplified version of the game, it's got the same locations, same music, and same cast of characters. Wait, why is that character blurred out? WHAT?! So, almost two years after its original release, Sonic Racing, not the console team Sonic Racing game, just the mobile Sonic Racing game, got an update that added three Green Hill Zone tracks, classic Sonic as a playable character, in the car from Sonic Drift, and an original remix of a song from Sonic Runners. WHERE WAS THIS IN DSR?! The main complaint with Team Sonic Racing after it launched was that there was no post-release content in an era where multiplayer games often get downloadable content a short while after they release. But, no, only 15 characters at launch, and four years later, I still wish we got an update to remove Zabba. I guess Sega heard the request for more content and accidentally pressed the Add Content to Sonic Racing button instead of the Add Content to Team Sonic Racing button. It just makes no sense to me how they thought people wouldn't care if you added more content to Team Sonic Racing, but, oh, we have to add Santiago to the mobile game. But it's still kind of cool that this exists in the first place, even if it's not in the version of the game that I prefer. Sonic Racing is, again, basically a simplified version of Team Sonic Racing, and also wraps up every version of Team Sonic Racing. Do I regret going over every single version of Team Sonic Racing? Uh, oh, absolutely. But I won't deny that it was kind of fun seeing all the differences each version of the game had. Like, do not tell me that you expected the online mode in Amazon Luna to be gutted. Now, after going over every single version, we have to ask, what is the best version of the game? That honor would probably go to the main console versions of the game. They're the full, unsimplified version of the game at the highest possible frame rate with no DRM and a fully functional online mode that probably won't work anyway. Like, look at me 90 years from now who's still waiting for an online match after I pitched my ideas for a Sonic Speed Simulator revamp. There's no coming back from this!